Hello, and welcome again to Married to Cinema. I'm Brian. I'm Whitney. I love movies. Me, not so much. So, on this special edition, we're reviewing one of my all-time favorite film soundtracks. Just kidding, we're reviewing the movie that it comes from. Whiplash. Any opening thoughts, Whitney? Um... A lot of jazz. There's a lot of jazz. If you don't like jazz, just know there's a lot of jazz. <laughs> a lot of jazz. It's centered around jazz. The film tells the story of a young man who's a college freshman named Andrew Naiman, who is this aspiring jazz drummer. And one day, he he's just caught practicing in a practice room at uh, Schaefer University, which is the most prestigious university for jazz musicians in the country. And he's caught by uh, Professor Fletcher, who's the most highly revered jazz uh, instructor in all of the U.S. And so then he's eventually brought into Fletcher's band where he just strives for greatness but Fletcher is a really tough teacher that pushes his students to the very edge of sanity really because he's trying to achieve greatness from everyone and weed out the weak ones so to speak he is the antagonist in this very intense thriller and that is the best way to describe the plot without giving too much away. So I can tell you want to say something. He is not... He's not pushing them. He's abusing them. You're absolutely right. Yes, he is a manipulative abuser. He's an abuser. Yeah, I don't know. I just didn't like... I don't know. that. It sound, don't make him sound better than he is. He's abusive. I'm giving a general um, synopsis, though. He also wants pictures of Spider-Man like, on his desk by tomorrow. Right? <laughs> <So> J.K. Simmons. <laughs> you can know this. Yes, he's a manipulative abuser, <laughs> but therefore, I mean, tomorrow. he's also not pushing them at the same time. He's not not pushing them, is what I mean to say. He is pushing them. Yeah, but it, bad. Bad pusher. Yes, very much so. And that is the point, is the, the further you get into the film, the more you realize he is a terrible human being. He's a terrible, manipulative abuser. And that's the kind of antagonist you don't see much in a film like this. Excuse us, the cats are having a playground. Sorry, guys. The cats. Girls, get out of here. Mm. They're fighting over, you know what, they're fighting over this hacky sack. Go in the other room with the hacky sack, both of you. Sorry. Okay, and this is when our audience finds out we don't edit these, and I'm leaving that in there. Uh, so, but yeah, he's abusive. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and the intensity really comes from where Andrew Naiman is. He's trying to persevere through this, and he's striving to be the best. He he will he will stop at no cost. But there's no point when Andrew n realizes, oh shit, I'm being abused. Even towards the end of the film when there are lawyers involved saying, hey, other people have reported that, uh... And that's when... This character, I can't think yeah. of J.K. Simmons' character. Fletcher. Name. Fletcher is abusive. He still won't. Alright, so I'll go ahead and say from here on out, spoilers... If you haven't seen the film, I don't want to spoil anything else, so turn it off now if you haven't seen it and you don't want it spoiled. But, but, yes. but yeah, he still doesn't recognize that as abuse. He's just saying, well, he kind of just locks up on him a little bit. Yeah, he's... He's not saying anything, really, actually. he's Because I think part of him understands Fletcher's point in that it's to drive people in these horrible ways is to create greatness like there's no greatness without madness insanity and just 
emotional violence, so to speak, like this torment within ourselves creates the greatness, you know, almost like the tortured artist motif, really. To have something broken inside of you can unlock this ability for greatness. That is his mentality, at least, I feel, from the film. As, a, as an educator, I didn't like that this guy was doing this to these students, regardless if they were over 18 in college or not. It's an abuse of power. I That was the big sticking point for me. I just liked that more than the jazz. But I also have str- trouble with abuse-type situations. Like, I don't really care to see that kind of thing. But... It, I mean, it was, even though I don't like jazz, I will admit that it was very well written, and it was powerful, and it did one thing that I'm always bitching about people not doing in these videos, which is the main characters did develop. Andrew's character really developed. He goes from being this uh, people pleaser, wow, I'm with Fletcher now, and I'm part of the big boy band, you know, to... In midway really fighting to keep his ground in the band, fighting past adversity, fighting past freaking car crash, to at the end realizing, no, I'm going to get mine, but also still saving the day in that final, t- like, piece when... The final set piece <sighs> of the film, yes. And he still takes Fletcher with him to victory in a way. Like, he's still, he's like, I'll cue you in. Like, he's like, you're a piece of shit, but I'm still not going to fail you. And he's he's also letting Fletcher know that you had this power over me for this time, and now I have the power over you. You're the one getting cued in now. I hold the power here. It's a complete switch. So I do have to say that I loved seeing that developmental arc for that character. And it's one of those abuse of power and abusive relationship type of movies that I've never mm-hmm. seen done in this type of way. I've never seen it done in a musical type of film. Yeah. Mostly you see it, it's an erotic romance thriller. Romance quotation because it's not romance, it's just it's horrible. It's Fifty Shades of Grey is what it is. Or Twilight even. They never actually do it in this kind of sense. They always do it in this superficial young adult pseudo-erotic kind of fashion where it involves, like, a person and their significant other. Right. But they never do it in the mentor-apprentice relationship. Well, I, I... I don't know what that word was. It just came out of my mouth. I... I... <laughs> I think one of the things that also, to me, was kind of irritating is that, like, we spend a little bit of time getting to know this girlfriend character that works in the concessions or something. Oh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the love interest. The popcorn girl, yeah. And then it's, like, very quickly, like, stomped out. And then they try to, like, bring it back at the end. I'm like, no, I don't care about her. Like, they could have completely just wiped that ten minutes in the movie out and put in more development. I disagree, because I don't think they spend much time on her at all. I think she is a device, for the opening of the film when he is uh, going to the movies with his father, played by Paul Reiser, by the way, who gets to show up here, which is cool. Um, she works at the concession stand, and you can tell, like, he kind of, he, he thinks she's cute and kind of likes her, to eventually him working up the courage to ask her out after, like, he's starting to, like, build up his ego from his achievement. And they have an awkward first date, but, you know, it's they still kind of like each other, and then... The next scene that you see with these two, he breaks up with her. So there's no real development there. It's like they start dating, and then next scene they break up. Next scene with those two. Because it shows how much that Fletcher's approval gets into his head. Because he he realized, like, no, I can't do this relationship. It takes up too much of my time. Don't you think we already saw how much Fletcher's approval gets to him when, like... Fletcher made them play that same chunk of this was music, fun. like yeah, but this was a thousand f- times in a row. No, but this was furthering it though. I mean, and then he like was in a car accident. This yeah, and the breakup happened before all of that though, because he was still going towards that point. Okay, okay. I mean, that... I see what you're saying, but I'm just saying yeah. like 
they, it was pretty obvious that Fletcher had way yeah. too much influence. And Andrew is, is selfish in his own goals. He is trying to achieve his dream. He wants Fletcher's approval. So he gets this new relationship, and then he's just like, no, I can't do it. I don't think it's right. You know, I'll just neglect you. We'll end up hating each other. Because he is, he is working. He is constantly playing the drums and practicing to his own aggression and detriment, really. And that's why I think that the relationship, it's in there just enough to be crucial to show more of his descent into his own chaos. And that's why at the end of the film, after he's kind of given up his dream, he gets another chance at a gig with Fletcher. Now the audience should know that something is going to happen here. But as we're watching it unfold, we don't exactly know what's going to happen necessarily. Um, he gives her a call and she goes, yeah, maybe I'll bring my boyfriend. And that's the whole turning point. Like he calls her because he's like, oh, I was an ass, you know, maybe I can double back on that. But then what I like about the film is it's not like she's not like, oh, yeah, absolutely. She's like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll bring my boyfriend because she's moved on. She's a sensible human who isn't driven to this brink I just, just of didn't obsessiveness. Think we needed her, though. Like your points all make it's, sense. Yeah, but I it's, just... it's a plot point. It's not essential she to the film. She could have just not been there. Yeah, it's not essential to the film, but it further hammers a point to the film and to this character's obsessiveness. I guess. It I'm has glad, its purpose. I'm also glad that Fletcher didn't get a redemption arc, because for a second I thought he was going to get one, and I was like, no, he's abusive, he doesn't deserve a redemption arc. arc. We don't abuse people period. He didn't deserve it. And he didn't get it, but you think he's gonna get it for a second. But he's just, he's evil. And that's one of the, my favorite things about this film is J.K. Simmons' performance as Fletcher. He is incredible because he is just terrible. He's one of my favorite cinematic villains because he's so abusive, manipulative, and evil in the film that you can't look away from. He's so entertaining to watch because you just believe it with all the conviction. Like, he brings it to this performance, and so, it's incredible, and it rightly deserved that Oscar. I'm so glad he won it for it. Oh, I can see why the Oscar makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it was really well done. Um, question, though. Question, question. Why do you think this is a thriller? It's a very intense film that you don't really know the beat that's going next, but you're following this, this character, Andrew, on his journey as he... A, does everything he can to achieve the approval of this this mentor and achieve greatness and become the next jazz great. And the lengths he goes to and the mental torment he experiences is very tense to watch. Like, people always talk about how anxiety-inducing the Softy Brothers work, like Good Time or Uncut Gems are. And to me, like, I guess I can see that. But for me, not as many films fill me with as much anxiety as this one does. This movie was so intense that I saw it in the theater and towards the finale I was biting my hat. I wore a hat back then, I don't really wear hats, but I was wearing a hat when I saw it and I grabbed my hat and I was biting it towards the end because it was so intense and I was on the edge of my seat. Now I think maybe, maybe one thing is for people's experience with it, you not viewing it as a thriller, that might have something to do with your distaste for jazz. Me, I love jazz. You, not so much. I, I think if I had seen it theatrically, m maybe I would have felt. But even when we rewatched it the other night, that was my first time seeing it in a few years. And back when it came out, saw it in the theater, then when it hit Blu ray, I watched I don't it several more times. I feel time. that tension that you're was, talking this about. This was my first time seeing it in years, and I was still feeling really tense, even though I knew every plot, every beat. Like, I knew exactly where I'm it was not, going. I'm not, I, I was didn't still really feel tense. that. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't good and the performances weren't good. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying I didn't feel. And I think that might be because you weren't as into the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is jazz. The score, everything. That's is very true. Jazz. Every the time lighting. they were doing jazz yeah. uh, solos, yeah. I was like, and even even the lighting is that low lit jazz style. Yes. When you think of jazz lighting, that is how this film is lit. So I think I think the whole film embodies itself as jazz, and I think that's why it didn't hit you beyond more of a superficial level than it did for others on like a more 
like intense. Yeah, sure maybe. Level. Sure maybe. I will say that like like you, I thought first of all, I don't know that I've seen J.K. Simmons in any role but Spider Man um, in when he's the newspaper guy from Spider Man. Did you see Juno? No. You didn't see Juno? Mm-hmm. Okay. You probably he's he's a great character actor. He's I done a lot. Swear, he's done I swear I don't so think much. He's so, so to much. me I will say his performance was gripping. Um, but I also wanted to kick the shit out of him. Uh, he's, but... he's like Christoph Waltz as Hans Lana and Glorious Bastards, where they're so good in that role, and you can't take your eyes off them, and you want to see more, but at the same time, you hate their character so much. And to me, that is compelling and creates a great cinematic That's villain. the only part of the movie that was tense for me. Every time he entered the room, I was like, oh God, please let a light fall from the ceiling and crush him, or like... Yeah. Please let him trip and roll down the stairs. Like, I just... Every time he came on, I, I immediately wished for his demise. But that's the only part that was tense for me. You got really tensed up with, like, these solos and stuff, and I was it's just cause like... because I get, I get so into those. I love so. the soundtrack. Like, this this is one of my favorite soundtracks. I go back to it a lot because it's so entertaining, and the musicianship is great. Like, Miles Teller's... Uh, for his role as Andrew Naiman, he studied jazz drumming a bit, but he never mastered it. That's why, like, you rarely see him actually play the drums. It's mostly insert shots during, like, the really complicated stuff because they used inserts. But he's still got, like, groundwork understanding of them. But um, the idea is because um, Damien Chazelle, writer-director, who would later go on to uh, make La La Land and be, like, a huge deal, uh, he was originally a jazz drummer. And so this film is a very personal film to him, kind of inspired by his journey as a jazz drummer, and that's why he made this. In fact, I believe like he made it as a short with uh, Johnny Simmons in the Miles Teller role and J.K. Simmons playing his role. And because Jason Reitman, the filmmaker who made Juno, actually urged him to do this, and that helped him gain the funding to make it into a feature film. So it was a very, a very personal thriller to... Chazelle, where he was making a film that was inspired by his own life and his journey as a jazz drummer, even though I don't I don't know the full story there, but I mean he eventually became this like huge deal filmmaker who's making all these big movies now. But it's interesting to look at that because this was his breakthrough. Before this, sure. he had like a small black and white indie. Okay, I'm not I don't regret watching it. I'll tell you that. What what would you rate it? This one for me, like, it, it always gets me on the edge of my seat, and I love the music, and even Miles Teller puts on a, a good performance in it, and I don't typically care for him. I This is one that I absolutely love. I go back to it a lot. One of my favorite films of 2014, which is one of my favorite years for a film. Probably my favorite of the 2000s, honestly. Um, but I give this movie a 9.5. I think it's excellent. There's very little wrong I see about it, but I, I just think it's such a tight good thriller where there's not a moment wasted. Even the Thanksgiving dinner scene is tense and and great. Okay. I gotta give it like a five. Um, Split it right down the middle because I'm gonna tell you what, I'm never gonna watch this again. I'm never gonna watch this again unless you are like, babe, will you please watch this with me? Like, I'm never gonna put that on on purpose. I'm never gonna scroll through TV and see that on and say, oh, I'll put this on for a while. Like, it's not my kind of film, but that doesn't make it bad. I'm just telling you, it's squarely in the middle for me. It had its merits. Didn't really care for it, though. It's okay. I love you. I'm sorry. I, I just hurt you your heart, didn't it's I? It's all right. It's just like five <laughs> is a negative review. Like, to get, like, okay, it's usually, like, a six that someone should give a film is when that's when they're like, it's okay. okay. That's that's my philosophy, at least, with film. I'm sorry. Right. Well, it's... That's all right. I mean, everybody has their own opinion. Like, you know what? You pick these more intense, like, emotionally demanding films, I feel like, and I feel like my films are like, oh, white chicks, like... Which, or, hey, you know, <laughs> cancer, <laughs> we're dying. Which you still, it was. you were like, that was, you know, whatever. Go watch the review of My Sister's Keeper. Oh, um, man. But, what a weird movie. Why don't you pull from the bag and you can see what torture device I have for you next. Hold the bag and let's see. Because <laughs> you hate it. I he hate it. That. I'm capable of liking the same movies. He I just, hates it. I hate it. It's well, well, five for Whiplash. This bro, bro, pick one Academy up. Academy Award nominated film. 
The Wedding Singer. Oh, I yay! Like the wedding singer. That'll be fun. That's a, that's a good movie. It is a good movie. Yeah, so I am looking forward to that. Actually. Don't wanna play. Kill me. Yes, I can't wait to watch oh, it. Oh, <laughs> I, I know every line to that song. I have that soundtrack. I love that movie. We're going to watch The Wedding Singer with my boyfriend in it. Also, I'll watch it with my boyfriend. Howard Ratner. Freaking love Adam Sandler, y'all. All right, so. Yes, so. be sure to like and subscribe to uh, Married Cinema and check out our other videos here and mm -hmm. uh, show our friends some love. My buddy Jay and all our projects on Jay vs. Yeah. Horror. We just did a video on... Um, underrated films you can stream for free on Tubi. If you're a horror buff, definitely check that out. We each picked some really great ones. And Whitney works with Jay's wife. Uh, Regina and Amy and uh, Kelly, Kelly and I have Girls Love Horror. We'll be dropping another video tomorrow and I'm going to be talking about Cube. Um, so if you like to hear me it's bash another things. another favorite of mine. Uh, check us out, like, and subscribe, the Girls Love Horror channel. Girls and, Love Horror 2. Yes, Girls Love Horror 2. And just, uh, yeah, share us to your friends. Help us get more followers. Yep, stay a community. Yeah. We love you all, and love Gigi us back. Gigi loves you. Yes. And uh, thanks, guys.